Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of the Three Consulting Amigos. Today, we've got the pleasure of uh, Ed Lasak is going to walk us through the importance of financial information, particularly for small businesses. In my experience, uh, is not uncommon with either uh, either Ed or Ron's. Most businesses don't either understand how to use it or how to use it to grow their business. So with that, Ed, uh, help us walk us through what's important about financial information, how to better use it to grow our business. Okay. Thank you, Ray. Um, I'd like to start off by summarizing the types of financial information that is available for businesses uh, to manage their companies. And um, I think it's important when, when as consultants to look at this list and kind of determine where we're at with each one of our clients. And a lot of times it's gonna start with the first one and that is the financial statements, analyze the past, and the, the one that um, people are most uh, interested in at the beginning, and they understand it the best is the income statement, which we've talked about. So uh, we have started at clients that didn't have an income statement, <laughs> believe it or not, or at least one that wasn't prepared right. Uh, but then uh, after you get the income statement down, then you start looking at the balance sheet, and uh, that is we uh, that isn't as well understood, and people don't focus much time on it. And then there's a third financial statement called the cash flow statement, and that reconciles how you did for the year net income down to how much cash you got in the bank. So those are the past uh, pieces of information that are important for determining how well you're doing. And then uh, is analyze the future is the next group and, and very few companies go this far. Um, budgets are, are, are one way of looking at it. And another way are projections. And, and I like to do projections for three to five years by month um, to get an idea how well we we're planning to do. So uh, very few companies uh, focus on, on that information. But we have uh, one company, Ron and I are working on right now, where we've gone from uh, the income statement and uh, not into the cash flow yet, but uh, now we're getting into budgets. And that's very helpful. And then the last component um, is valuation, how to value the business. And um, that is basically looking at uh, cash flow for the next three to five years and you project your balance sheet, your income statement, your cash flow statement. And this is where you really get owners to really understand the big picture. And uh, so it's an evolution. You, you start with the past information and then you start working on projections and then you get into valuation. The um, information that is prepared in accounting is has to be prepared in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles, which is GAAP. You've heard of that. I, I know you have, all of you have, but it's really important because without GAAP, there would be no consistency of reporting transactions. So you wouldn't be able to compare one year to the next year, or you couldn't compare one company with another company. Um, and outside users would be very, very confused. But uh, anyway, the key concepts related to GAP are as follows. And it, obviously they're a lot more extensive. I mean, people go to school four years to learn accounting and uh, are required to take a very, uh, very comprehensive exam called the CPA exam. And it's a lot more than these, but this is a great way of looking at it to get started. And the first one is the accrual basis of accounting. And that's where you recognize revenue when it's earned and expenses when incurred rather than when you pay them or you receive the money. So that's, that's a real important concept. And another important concept is to match expenses with revenue. So if you got an income statement where you, you have all your expenses, but you don't show your revenue related to those expenses, obviously you don't, you're not getting a clear picture of how well you're doing. The other thing that's really important is that financial statements prepared by CPAs is primarily historical cost based on what you paid for something. 
and it does not include goodwill uh, of the corporation unless you bought a company and, and recognize that goodwill. But typically, goodwill is not in um, the balance sheet. And uh, really, to do a good job on uh, financial statements, you really need to have someone who's a CPA to make sure you're in compliance with GAAP. And um, it happens all the time. They find a transaction that's kind of unusual and uh, ownership gets involved. They want everything to look good, so they report it the wrong way. And um, that's not in accordance with GAAP. So uh, when it goes to the bank, the bank or the bank's going to have issue with that type of reporting. And a lot of banks require that financial statements are compiled with a CPA or reviewed with a CPA or audited with a CPA so that they, they make sure that uh, the, the numbers are in accordance with GAAP. The other thing is you got to have strong internal controls uh, so that you're reporting information timely and accurately without internal controls and people can get creative with financial statements and, and you don't want creativity related to accounting. You want creativity more in the marketing side and maybe the design side, but definitely not in the financial realm of the business. And uh, you need to get financial information uh, timely uh, so that you can make decisions. And when you see a lot of subsequent adjustments to uh, the numbers, you know you have problems with uh, reporting the numbers. So, you know, it's not, you don't look for uh, or anticipate big adjustments to your financial statements in the future. And, and worse yet, when you use QuickBooks, sometimes you can go back and co correct previous periods and that way uh, management's not, and ownership's not uh, aware of some of the negative adjustments that are going on in the company. And that's happened to me by, I caught everybody by surprise. So you gotta make sure that they're running the current, any type of big adjustments through the current month rather than going back and changing months. That's a no-no. And uh, financial statements are also a, uh, a, the foundation for tax reporting. That's where they start. And, uh, but there can be differences between tax and book, like on depreciation, usually depreciation for book purposes, you uh, depreciate over a uh, useful life that could be different than for tax. And it's usually straight line. Whereas tax, there's all kinds of accelerated methods for reporting depreciation to minimize your taxes that you are paying. And um, basically uh, banks are really dependent upon this information and, um, you know, you have the corporate shield to protect people in the company if you uh, lose money and, and you go out of business. But if you're uh, fraudulently reporting financial statements um, and you're a shareholder of the company, you're on the hook. So it's really in everybody's best interest to, to make sure you're reporting uh, accurately and timely in accordance with GAAP. Uh, before you go on, Ed, I, I wanted to just touch base with, with Ron and, and uh, myself a little bit to talk about how often in small businesses, this detailed analysis that you just presented is either missing or misinterpreted. And I think you kind of alluded to that. Uh, but I know I've had situations where it's been very difficult as they move to selling. You know, the data is so weak that basically, you know, they can't really put together a meaningful um, presentation because people say, well, I don't understand this. The numbers and what I see are so radically different. Ron, have you had any uh, experiences like that? Oh, yeah, I think uh, yeah, through, throughout my career, um, both, <clears throat> both in business and working with different CPAs and different kinds of businesses, but especially in the consulting realm for, you know, 30 years, uh, I would go into you know, many small businesses and, and, you know, they, they'd, this has been, been a while, but I mean, they'd, they'd be putting their receipts, you know, uh, in a shoebox, And, uh, I'd say, how did, how'd you do? I'm there, there to help them, you know, measure their, their sales and, and so forth and, and, uh, help them move forward. And, you know, they, they'd tell me how much money was in the bank and, uh, 
in the early days, I mostly dealt with retailers. And th that's just a really bad way to determine how much money you made because <laughs> never, as, as Ed already stated, um, you know, when it goes in the bank, it's a couple of days old and you might say, well, those are sales and, you know, that's fine. But, um, you know, what, what about the change in inventory? And uh, you're paying for inventory 30 days late, uh, later than you received it. You may have already sold the inventory uh, before it, it would, uh, you know, come out of your bank account. And so, I mean, the things are, are mismatched period by period so poorly that there's just no way that you can put that together unless you have a financial statement. Now, you, know, you talked about cash versus accrual. I think I think today with with today's bookkeeping system, it's so easy to do accrual. It wasn't that way when I started, and uh, we dealt with on the cash basis, meaning you, you you literally just counted the cash that, as it came in and and so forth. But you know, we would get you know financial statements, manual financial statements on a quarterly or annual basis, and so trying trying to do all of these things was very very difficult early on. Um, I, I uh, hired a, a bookkeeper who had a, a Wang accounting system, which was really revolutionary back in 1974 for a small business. Uh, and the reason was is that I, I, I couldn't run my business at all because I was not getting timely financial statements. I was growing too fast. Uh, I had too many things going on. I could not tell how to, how to really do anything. Uh, you know, what should I make decisions on? based on my receipts for the day and, and meanwhile my inventory was growing exponentially um, I had no idea so um, I made those early moves and since that point and especially in the last 10 years um, with the use of electronic accounting systems that are either on your computer or, or in the cloud uh, there's really no excuse for not not having good financial statements and I don't think Ed, there are any excuses for not doing an accrual system. Um, no. Am I right about that? Yeah, you're right, Ron. And I, I, I think where um, businesses really fall down is they, they hire a controller that might be really okay with closing the books, but doesn't understand um, the basics of accounting because I never went to school mm -hmm. and they learned on the job. So they're not going to provide that expertise. They're going to they're going to be able to close the books, but you need somebody with a CPA certification, and that's where CPAs come in, in line to make sure that the company yeah. is reporting in accordance with GAAP. Yeah, that's really important. Yeah, it but, is. But sometimes uh, what's important for a CPA, an outside CPA, is not as is uh, less important to the inside CPA because. Inside, you want to break things out so you can slice and dice and understand how to run the company. And uh, a lot of times from the CPA's perspective, they're, they're preparing the financial statements for the bankers. Well, the bankers don't need to know all that detail, but management right. does. And so, taxes, right? So they're, they're, they're worried about where they do. And they're worried about taxes, which is another great um, service that they provide because that saves you money. And uh, they're really on top of that, which is really important. But again, how you use your financial statements inside your company can vary quite a bit, whether the CPA is outside of the company or inside of the company. Yeah. So uh, anyway, those are really good points. Thank you. So uh, I wanted to start off with the income statement and that's the one I think the three of us understand the best. You know, We've done the most with this with our clients and and uh, basically it tells you uh, over a period of time how well you're doing. Um, so um, most common, best understood elements, uh, it's most common and, and best understood by the people that use it because they wanna know how well they're doing on an annual basis. And they usually have their revenue lines uh, noted. Um, gross profit margins by product as we've been through with our clients is extremely important. And uh, that's uh, that's something you really got to keep an eye on. And then you break out G&A and sales expense by line item. And, and you, you look at it compared to last year and according to the budget and two years ago, or according to your forecast, all those different ways of, of comparing your numbers so you understand them. 
And uh, as Ron has indicated, and I've learned a lot about uh, this from him, is that break-even point. So the income statement is really helpful to determine break-even. And when we say break-even, you, um, you have to have enough revenue to cover your fixed expenses. And, uh, and then after that point in time, your fixed expenses are already taken into effect. So anything above that, your margins go up significantly because you're only dealing with variable expense. Right. And I think the other thing on the income statement, um, when you, and you may not know this, but uh, lot, most corporations are S-corps. And with an S-corp, when you look at net income at the bottom, that's before taxes because taxes are passed down to the shareholders and they're not included as part of the financial statements for the company. So that's a big distinction. A C Corp will have um, income before tax and income after tax because the C Corp pays taxes directly. And when they pass along dividends to the shareholders, the, the, uh, those dividends will be included in those shareholders uh, in personal income tax forms. So uh, I wanted to briefly kind of go through one of these here. We have an example here. Um, and it's just pretty basic net revenues. Uh, and we, we take away from revenues, we take away the cost of goods and we come up with uh, gross profit. And then you see the general administrative expense, selling expenses. Um, the big line item that's really important is income from operations and stuff below the line would be uh, interest income, interest expense, a new a lost or, or a sale on the sale of equipment. And, uh, and then you have your net income. Um, in this situation, the example I have here, this is an escort because uh, this is net income before taxes. And then you have your ultimate margin. So this is something that we see every day when we're consulting with our clients, correct? Hopefully. Yeah. Or at least monthly, right? <laughs> and I think people understand this pretty well. Um, owners understand this, employees. I think everybody kind of understands the income statement because it's really important to, to make money every year. Yeah, it does. I think some of those nuances that we talked about really have to do with gap and <clears throat> what are we reporting? And is this, uh, you know, because we have run into it in the past, you know, net revenues might, might be a cash basis versus accrual basis. And so cash, as we mentioned, cash is when you get it and you put it in the bank and accrual is when, when it occurs, as, as Ed mentioned. So you might have revenues that occur <clears throat> one month, but you don't get paid, paid until the following month. And so that's a situation that, uh, you know, doesn't happen in retail very often, but it happens in, in wholesale all the time because you're extending terms to, to uh, your customers. So you may do um, $50,000 in sales, but you may only collect $30,000 of that <clears throat> plus, and therefore it's the 50,000 that you need to know. It's not the 30,000. And the other side of that is that <clears throat> when you get into say the following month and you do another say $52,000 in, <clears throat> in business that month, uh, you know, you're gonna still receive some money from the $50,000 in the in the following month <clears throat> so cash can get spread out over three or four months but when you receive the revenue it only occurs in that single month based on when it hits your books when is the purchase order uh finalized when is the sale finalized etc so i think you know the time period is important and that's true with <clears throat> uh expenses as well uh business owners need to need to have a good sense of well, when did the, the expenses actually occur? You may prepay for some expenses. You may, um, uh, especially if you're small and you don't have any credit yet, you may, you, you may have a big power bill in a manufacturing uh, this particular month, but the bill comes next month. And so you end up booking it the following month. Well, that, that may not be a problem if you have a consistent business over time and month after month. And then, so you get into three months, four months, six months, that averages out pretty well. And you might say, well, that's not really very material. But if you have extraordinary expenses that show up, maybe you've got a contract that um, uh, you, uh, it's a big contract 
and you get a big, the, the cost of that would be outside services. So you bring in $20,000, but you've got outside services of $50,000. <clears> that outside services portion, the $50,000 is not shown in the same month as the, the revenue. Then what happens is, is that it makes it look like you made a huge amount of money one month and then the, and then you pay for it the next month and then you, you make no money the next month. But, well, we know that's not true. <laughs> uh, you, you had a $20,000 uh, sale, you had a $10,000 cost uh, for contract services or whatever, whatever that was, and it might have been an extraordinary or a large, large amount for your particular business. And so, wow, you know, what was the, what was the real cost? Did you really make any money on that particular project? <clears throat> and of course, and one thing, of course, that solves that is cost accounting, where you get down to the individual items and the individual um, uh, individual revenue points. But that's that's yet another level of detail that we're not going to go into today but um so yes the financial the income statement is fairly straightforward and you you know you, you just you you kind of subtract your costs and get your gross profit and you subtract all your operating expenses you know and there you know it's all there but it's important that small business um, people understand how these numbers are put together gap helps a lot with that automated uh, systems electronic accounting systems really help a lot with that so um you know but these are the kinds of things we used to deal with this kind of stuff to the point to where uh, i mean I, I i can remember closing out books and we didn't know if we made money until the end of the year and that's a pretty lousy way to make a correction you know two months three months after the end of the year you get a corrected financial statement you cannot run a business like that today. It's just well, I, it's funny. I, I, <laughs> I did some work for a a pretty large regional CPA firm, and they were doing the books of a pretty big company, um, a restaurant with multiple locations, and um, they were doing their write up work, and they weren't getting them the information for like six months after the end of uh, of a month. And I'm saying to myself, yeah. What good is this? No, this is well, prepared in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Yeah, but it's so late. How can you use this information to run a business? Well, and see, I, I, the point is you can't. I mean, that is completely or uh, almost completely totally useless. When it's six months old, you're now 18 months old from the first month of the pre previous year. That That's just not material anymore. So the CPAs, and it's important, I think, <clears throat> to reiterate this. You mentioned it, CPAs are really, really, really good at taxes. I mean, they're really good at taxes. Uh, I I have always had a CPA do do my taxes, and um, and found it to be very valuable. Not only to keep me out of hot water, but uh, they they don't look at operations, and that isn't their emphasis. And therefore, they're thinking, well, we've got to get this ready so that we can do you know proper tax accounting. And then they they do all of that stuff and it might take six months and they just get an extension and they finally pay the bill and they're estimating how much the bill is and the corporation puts up with it. I can't believe that that any company would still put up with that that kind of thing, to, especially today with electronic bookkeeping. You know, there is no excuse for that. There has not been an excuse for being 30 days late on a financial statement since 1980. You know, I mean, that's not an excuse anymore. Fire your CPA if that's the best they can do. Uh, yeah, I think I think the the real important part that Ed um, and and we are trying to convey is that you need financials on a regular monthly basis as a actual as opposed to historical. Um, and you know that's where so many companies do poorly. I think. Yes. Yeah. And I, I, I don't think the owners take the responsibility that's necessary to generate the accurate information. They, a lot of times they want to save money and they don't always view the finance department or the accounting department to be uh, a uh, cost effective department. So they, they skimp in that area. Yeah. And um, I, I think it really hurts the company overall because if you can't run a company if, unless you have accurate financial statements on a timely basis. No. No, you, you can't. And, and it takes a long time. And 
uh, in, in my uh, retail business, <clears throat> even with, uh, with uh, electronic uh, digital systems, it still took 60 or 90 days to, to get them nailed down and get the inventories and get everything squared away. It's, it, you know, it was very hard to run. And um, I would say for me to understand the margins and turnover on inventory in my business, it took a concerted effort in five years to, to actually get that nailed down. It's a hard, hard problem, especially if you get started and you don't you don't start properly out of the gate. It's a hard system and you can't run your business knowledgeably that way. You just can't. Do it. OK, so the income statement is is the statement that has the most popularity and probably the best understanding. Now we're going to get into the balance sheet. And this one here has uh, less people understand the balance sheet or review the balance sheet. A balance sheet is an account of how the business is doing at a point in time. Um, that's that's the difference. Income statement is a period of time. Balance sheet is a point in time. Um, not many people really truly understand it. They don't review it in detail. Um, one of the big concepts here is assets have to equal liabilities and owners equity. So it keeps everything in balance. You can't book a one-sided entry um, because the, the this equation will no longer be valid. And, and that's one of the ways that a lot of companies keep track of everything so that they're doing their journal entries accurately in compliance with generally accepted accounting principles. An interesting point on the balance sheet, when you look at a balance sheet, you'll see that the most liquid assets are noted first and, uh, and, it has, and down the balance sheet, it's less liquid. So cash is, is the first item on the balance sheet is the most liquid. So keep that in mind when you're looking at it. One of the really important metrics is working capital because it takes a while be, from the time you start something to the time you finish it and bill it, you're incurring a lot of expense and that impacts your working capital. So you have to have enough money, which is current assets minus current liabilities. You gotta have enough money uh, on your balance sheet to keep that company in business. And a lot of times, some companies have been very profitable, but they didn't have enough uh, working capital to continue on and they went out of business. So that's I mean, a that, really important part. That happens when you grow um, as well. And a lot of people don't yeah, associate absolutely. that as the same thing. And in using the same example, uh, uh, the, re the retail business, we were growing so rapidly and I kept fueling the business. And my banker kept telling me, oh, you need more inventory, you need more inventory. He was willing to loan me money to buy more inventory. Well, but the turnover went down, man, that's another discussion. Um, and so the turnover goes down and guess what happens? Your margins go down eventually because you have markdowns in the retail business. The older it gets, <clears throat> the, the less it's worth. Um, and people, you know, <laughs> People used to actually think that things got more valuable, I guess, in high inflation times, <laughs> they may think it gets more valuable. But but for the most part, uh, we we outran the growth of the company, outran the accumulation of costs of, of uh, cash. Hmm. And it was a real problem. I mean, a real problem. I would say that I spent 30 percent of my time managing cash because uh, we were we were having to get terms all the time. We couldn't pay for it. They, we couldn't, we couldn't sell it fast enough to be able to catch up. You know, the only time you catch up in a business like that is when you stop growing uh, and you stop, you stop buying stuff and you, and you literally grow into your pants. And so um, I didn't understand for many years how important un the, the cash flow was worth uh, was, was to staying in business. And being cash poor was something that, um, I mean, it, it takes its toll on people. It, it, it beats owners up. It beats them up. And so uh, and looking at, at working capital in this particular way, as you've mentioned, is good for big corporations that might have 60 or 90 or 120 days of cash on hand. 
But when you're growing rapidly, that's usually not the way it works. And and um, you have to do cash flow based on the week. And that's and that's a different that's a, di a different thing than a balance. You just want to point it, point that out. Yeah, that, that you you brought up a very good point. And um, when you're doing valuation work, if you're and you're trying to grow a company, you have to include more working capital. It's an outflow of cash. So if you're growing revenue by say one dollar, uh, you should at least have ten to fifteen cents in there for the cost of working capital. Mm -hmm. And uh, another way of dealing with working capital well, capital is to get with your bank and get a line of credit lined up because uh, for the timing differences that can happen as you're growing, you, you need to have that little uh, uh, security deposit on the side that you can use as needed um, to pay for expenses. Right, right. It takes a lot more time than people realize from the time you start incurring expenses to the time you bill, and then you have to wait another 30, 45 days to collect the money. In the meantime, you got to keep paying your people, paying for the um, raw materials, et cetera. Yeah. And let me give, give a little bit more flesh to that particular thing. So in the business that I was in, it's a very slow, the average turnover was two times a year, meaning, meaning that if you do $100,000 a year in business, you're going to have $50,000 at retail um in in your operation at all times so it's a fifty thousand dollar investment in order to do a hundred thousand dollars in business and um not at cost but at retail dollars and and so you have to pay for you have to pay for that so but here's the point a two-time turnover means that it's going to take you six months to sell on an average item so it comes in to, you know, on day one, your, your invoice starts ticking away. You've got 30 days to pay for it. And at the end of 30 days, unless it's an extraordinary seller, but on average, at the end of 30 days, you've only raised enough money to pay one sixth or actually because of cost versus retail, um, maybe one third of the invoice. So if you're growing, and you're going from 50,000 to 60,000 to 70,000, you will do nothing but put your cash in the hole worse month after month after month. It's, it's, a, it's a dynamic that is incredibly important. And, and I would just say that is, that's the, one, the, the biggest shortcoming of the balance sheet is it does not address that issue. I think- because, Well, it does, show, it does show up on your, as you'll go get into it, it does show up on on your the inventory does show up in your balance sheet so I, I take that back to that extent at least you can see how much inventory it's included in your working capital you bet and i think yeah. you know, i want to add this point is that most of the small businesses with whom we work you know don't really have anybody but a cpa who's only interested in historical data the person who's doing their um <clears throat> accounting is typically a clerk who you know really has a very limited understanding of these things and so that's why in my mind it's so important to have somebody like an ed who's able to do this on a part-time basis to give them better insights as to how to run their business yeah I, I think a cfo really is valuable to every company and you need to have your cpa for for taxes you, you need a cfo to make sure you're in compliance with uh, generally accepted accounting principles, make sure you're presenting the information in a manner that can be used to make decisions, and uh, also make sure that they're every uh, all everything's connected and um, everybody understands what's going on. So, and and these key ratios are really important. And in an event down the road when we get into other case, other um, um, case studies here, we'll be talking about some of the ratios and how important they are. But uh, anyway, working capital is a big one. Another big one is equity versus debt. And so when you go in and you see a balance sheet and you see no debt, usually that's a pretty good sign that the company's going to be able to um, weather any storms coming down the road. But by the same token, they're leaving a lot of opportunity because the cost of debt, because you can write off the interest on debt, the cost of debt is a lot less than the cost of equity. Mm -hmm. So um, you want to be able to balance the two. So 
And if you look at a company that's got all debt and no equity, which we've seen some of those situations too, mm -hmm. that's really, really um, high risk company because they, they have nothing. Uh, if anything hits them that's unexpected or the revenue goes down, they have nothing to absorb those losses. Mm -hmm. So that, that's another thing that a balance sheet can really help you with. And I, I think it's worth the time and effort for the owners to sit down with their financial staff, their CPA and their C CFO and make sure they understand what a balance sheet is and how they can use it to better manage their company. Agreed. Yeah. I, uh, if, I can, if I can add this, Ed, I think one of the reasons people don't do this is they have this uh, idea that, you know, getting a, CF, uh, a CFO is so expensive that they won't do anything as opposed to getting one on a part-time basis that can address some of the issues you're talking about. I, I guess it comes down to people leave money on the table all the time. If you don't know that there's money on the table and you don't know how much there right. is, you really can't analyze a situation. Yeah. And, and it just seems like many owners are so concerned about paying out anything for any reason um, when it comes to the uh, financial side of the, of the house um, that they, they lose out on all these opportunities because they don't know what they don't know. Yeah. And they don't know yeah. how much money they're leaving on the table. And yeah. quite frankly, most of the time, it's a lot of money. And not only that, it's the increased risk of not knowing how to navigate and minimize some of those risk uh, yeah. opportunities um, can really kill a company also. That's right. So uh, we have the current at, we have the assets, um, which are basically current assets, which cash, accounts receivable, inventories, other current assets. The inventories are on there and so are receivables. Those are two things you gotta watch out for because this, it, uh, the bigger those numbers are, the longer it takes uh, to, to monetize um, your income. And, uh, and then you have equipment, leasehold improvements, and other assets. Uh, pretty typical. Uh, you have uh, liabilities. You have current liabilities, long-term liabilities. And then after you, you take your assets, less your liabilities, hopefully you got something left, and it's called stockholders' equity, and they break it out between how much is common stock, retained earnings, how much dividends you're paying, your net income, and you come up with an ending balance. And hopefully this is a healthy number uh, because um, I, I'll never forget it. Ron, when we were working on a project together and Ron says we need uh, $3 million of cash. Um, I think we went through that whole process over time and we, we really were talking about, we need $3 million of owner's equity. Equity, yeah. I was talking about equity, right? Yeah, that and because uh, if you had $3 million worth of cash, every auditor in the world would write you up because you're not utilizing your cash properly. Yeah, well, but it depends, you, depends on how big the company is. <laughs> the bigger this number is, the more you can weather a high risk situations that could come up down the road like COVID. Well, and, and so that total stockholders equity, uh, not the bottom line, but the next to the bottom line, yeah. that's, that really tells you um, if you if you have any um, uh, any stores in your warehouse, it's like uh, how much grain is in your is in your yeah. warehouse. Yeah. And uh, if you don't have any of that, that means that uh, you're not going to do well in if you're in Egypt uh, when, when the uh, when the next famine hits, you're 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 dead. You're literally going to be dead. And I think I think that the you know that's sort of like wealth. Yeah, it a is. Lot of, a lot of a lot of people don't really understand that stockholders' equity represents what what your if you just closed everything out, you sold everything, and your values are right. That's how much money you're going to end up with, and uh, that that gets hidden in a lot of different places, a lot of different ways, which is what the balance sheet does so well to really show where that money is hiding. Uh, because that's certainly not going to be in your bank account. It's not going to match your bank account in any way, shape, or form, you know. And but that's what that's what it's worth, minus a little thing called depreciation and some of those other things, which we probably are not going to have time to get into. But um, uh, the the point, the, I think, the point that 
business people need to understand. And I'll, and I'll just admit that I'm one of them. It took me years to get this down. It's not about how much money you make. It's how much money you keep. And you can make a lot of money, but if your balance sheet is not reflecting that your stockholders' equity is going up, then you're on a treadmill going backwards. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not running. You're not running as fast as the treadmill is moving. You're actually working like crazy, and you're getting further and further close to the end, where it's going to throw you off the treadmill. So the stockholders' equity thing is like it, it's absolutely key, and it's. I think in the in longer term, maybe not for the month, but longer term, it's the most important thing, mm. even as opposed to income. Yes, uh, it because, is. because income tells you where you were for last month or last period in terms of the net between what you bought and what you what you you spent, or what yes. you received and what you spent. But this really shows you a variety of things. Um, my my only uh, question about it is, is, and I've always had this issue, and that is that and this is not market value. Um, and it, it, that if you happen to to be buying uh, masters, old masters paintings as part of part of your your business, um, there's a pretty good chance that if you held those a lot a lot of that kind of inventory for a long period of time that the value of those paintings is going to be 10 times what it shows in the books so it's it's value that is key to long-term business i think and and i have to say i didn't i i did okay in the real estate business i understood value there but in terms of business business I don't think I was all that successful in terms of of increasing the inherent value of the business. You know? yeah, you're right. The um, the typical financial statements do not show goodwill. Yeah. And um, and that's one of the negatives. But when you do a valuation, you do show goodwill. So that was the last component. I know. I didn't want to go there too far. And I think we'll get into that in a future session. But I wanted to cover the last statement that you get with your financial statements that nobody understands. Very few people know how to calculate these numbers. And also, um, if you're doing, if you're going for the CPA exam, I tell you, a lot of people fail because they don't understand the cash flow statement. And basically, it goes like this. It reconciles, it starts with net income, and then it adds back all the different cash components that happen during the year. And it reconciles to the cash you have in the bank at the end of the year. It's a kind of interesting calculation, net income to what cash you have in the bank. And uh, so you understand all the all the different transactions on how it impacts cash. And um, so, and it's usually reported in three different areas. It's reported as how much cash are you generating from operations? How much cash are you investing in the company? And then the last component, how much cash are you getting from financing one way or another? And the statement looks like this. It's... I'm telling you, it takes some time to be able to calculate these numbers because you got to look at the changes of balance sheet items. And, uh, but you can see it starts off with net income. And the first thing you add to it is depreciation because depreciation isn't a cash expense. And uh, then you look at the changes on your balance sheet and then you come up with uh, a net cash provided by operations. And then you look at the investing activities. Um, when you purchase equipment, it doesn't show up on your on your income statement. Uh, it's a that's called capex, and that's added to uh, items on your balance sheet. It's equipment, uh, but it's a cost of running a company. So um, when you look at a company that's making a say a million dollars a year, and it has to invest a half a million dollars a year in CapEx, that takes away from your profitability significantly. And then you look at uh, increases in your uh, your credit uh, and financing facilities, and you eventually come up with how much cash you started with in the month or the year, and how much you're ending up with at the end of the year. 
Uh, this one here needs to be, this statement needs to be prepared in most companies because they're not preparing it and they should be. Yeah, I agree. And then um, and to, and um, today, is that something a CFO can do for them? Oh, absolutely. That's what a C, well, right now we're working on a client. We're great. We have a great controller, but, um, and they've never been able They've always focused on net income, but they've never focused on how much cash they have. Right. And uh, so uh, you, you got to be able to get this, uh, this thinking in line and start preparing this financial statement. And it doesn't, uh, most, most digital systems can just spit this out as a report. Yes, they can. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not that hard to do anymore. No, it isn't. Uh, but of course the transactions and if you're doing journal entries and all that, that's another entirely different conversation. Um, but, and also, I just wanted to mention, this is not what I would call a cash flow forecast, uh, but, but it's like a sources and uses of funds or, or a cash positioning over the, a period of a year. It has a starting and an ending date, and it really shows you where your cash was used, which is quite insightful. But you can't use this to pay your bills 60 days from now. No, that's why uh, in, yeah. the future, in future episodes... We're going to talk more about forecasting. Yeah. And we're going to talk more about valuation because that's where these, these statements, the past statements are great for trying to determine where you have been, but they're not very useful determining where you're going. Right. And they're not very useful in determining the value of a company. So that's where you have to add those two components on. And I, and I guarantee you, nobody's using this statement. Very few people are doing uh, forecasting and nobody, as far as I'm concerned, is doing valuation on a annual basis. <laughs> right. I think you're right. I think each one of those goes down quite a bit uh, as a percentage of the total businesses. You know, you've got about half of them doing it at each step along the road. Yeah, I, um, I had a meeting this week with the company and um, we went over the valuation part. It started with total confusion of trying to understand the numbers and where they're going, going, coming from, and um, how how reliable the, uh, the the projections are, et cetera. But at the end of the whole process, it was one of the most uh, meaningful meetings I've ever attended because light bulbs went off in people's minds, and they saw how this could really be used for them to determine how to manage their company. Mm -hmm. So instead of spending a half a million dollars a year in capital expenditures, maybe they could do it for $400,000 a year. Mm. And, and that $100,000 goes right in their pocket right? and increases the value of the company. So uh, I think uh, we're working on a way to do that, to uh, have the valuation as part of the normal financial review. Mm -hmm. And that way everybody understands. So when people make decisions, they understand the total impact of that decision rather than just one little component. Right. And unfortunately, as you mentioned at the beginning of this, Ron, most owners focus on revenue, mm -hmm. right? Every, that's top of mind, top of the income statement. It depends upon how much money you actually net in cash is how valuable that company is. Yeah, that's right. Valuation methodology is all based upon cash flow. Whether you're doing an evaluation of a stock or a company or whatever, it's all based upon how much cash flow that asset's going to throw off. And I think at this point in time, it's a good place to stop. And... Uh, Maybe next week we can talk more about forecasting and valuation. Yeah, that was a really good foundation. Uh, and, and let me just re kind of remind everybody that, that, uh, uh, that has made it this far in this video. Uh, and we'll put a link on the, on the end of the video. But we have uh, a, a, all, all of the eight drivers for value that uh, the three of us have put together. It's, it's really Ed's. Ed's formula for um, driving increased value in your business. And those are already done and, and on our, our YouTube channel. So that you can do. We've also got a couple of shorter cash flow things on there. So a couple of these things have, 
uh, will, will be part of our channel. So don't don't forget to check into those if you have specific issues, you know, too, because some of the some of those resources are are, are 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 there now. Yeah, especially the valuation piece, which we really covered, I think, in about six or eight different videos. Yeah, thank you um, again, Ed. As always, it's always valuable to be able to help small businesses understand the power of finance and what it can do to uh, enable them to both grow their business and protect their business. You know, so with that, again, thanks, uh, Ed, for what you did, Ron. I always appreciate your insights from your business experience. Uh, we, uh, we again appreciate everybody's uh, participation in this, and we look forward to carrying this to a next level next week. Thank you.